Hello YouTube. Today I'm going to talk about a scholar in Islam called Ibn Qayyim, a famous scholar, a student of Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, and someone who hated Christianity and wrote one of the primary books that is used today by Muslims in their anti-Christian polemics. We're going to do an overview of Ibn Qayyim and we'll read an introduction of his book. You can expect more of this in the future as I will do an in-depth analysis. So who was Ibn Qayyim? I couldn't read that if I tried. But you'll notice he was from the Hanbali school of Fiqh. So he was born 1292, died in 1350. And he's commonly known as Ibn Qayyim al Jazia, the son of the principal of the school of Jazia. He was an important medieval Islamic jurist, a theologian, and a spiritual writer belonging to the Hanbali school of orthodox Sunni jurisprudence. And he is regarded as one of the most important thinkers in Islam, and especially in the school of jurisprudence of the Hanbali. So he is best remembered as the foremost disciple and student of very, very influential 14th century Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. I did a six-part series on Ibn Taymiyyah's book on Jihad. That's on the channel and I will link that later. And also I did a video on Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah's book on Sab al-Rasul or the punishment given for insulting Islam or any of the tenets of Islam. He and Ibn Taymiyyah were imprisoned together in the citadel of Damascus in 1326. And numerous important Islamic scholars of the Mamluk period were among Ibn Qayyim's students, all greatly influenced by him, including very, very important Islamic historian and major tafsir author Ibn Kathir. Ibn Qayyim is popular among Salafis in the Sunni Wahhabist movement. A person's tongue can give you the taste of his heart, said by Ibn Qayyim. If this is true, then Ibn Qayyim had a very black heart. Let's look at Ibn Kathir's praise. Ibn Kathir is a name known to all Muslims. He's a very, very famous scholar. He lived roughly between 1300 and 1373 and was a highly influential Islamic historian. He did extensive exegesis of the Quran and he was a scholar also during the Mamluk era in Syria. He was an expert on Quranic exegesis known as tafsir and also Islamic law or jurisprudence known as the fiqh, or in this case, fahi. He wrote several books, including a 14-volume universal history. So, very educated man. Ibn Kathir wrote a famous commentary on the Quran named Tafsir al-Quran, al-Azim, which linked certain hadiths, or sayings of Muhammad and sayings of the Sahaba, or Muhammad's companions, to verses of the Quran in explanation. Sunni Muslims hold his commentary as the best tafsir after Tabri. He's very highly regarded, especially amongst the Salafis. He wrote a book on jihad at the commission of the Mamluk governor of Damascus, which is a defense of armed jihad against the neighboring Christian powers, such as the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia, based on the evidence of the Quran and the Sunnah justifying jihad. Ibn Kathir stated that Ibn Qayyim was the most affectionate person. He was never envious of anyone, nor did he hurt anyone. He never disgraced anyone, nor did he hate anyone. I do not know in this world, in our time, someone who is more dedicated to acts of devotion. Let's look at the words of Ibn Rajab. Ibn Rajab, one of Ibn Qayyim's students, stated that although he was by no means infallible, no one could compete with him in the understanding of the texts. Thus, he is said to be a very competent and very knowledgeable Islamic scholar. He authored a work called the Fat al-Bari, but he died before its completion. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani began his famous commentary on Sahih Bukhari and he gave his own work the same title in honor of Ibn Rajab. Now what Ibn Qayyim is best known for is a poem against Christianity. It's called O Christ Worshippers and Muslims call it a Qasida which refutes Christianity. However, he wrote much more than this. That will be the topic of this video. But let's have a look at this poem. Ibn Qayyim hated Christians. He hated Christianity. This position is orthodox Islam. It is aligned with the Sharia of Muhammad. Qayyim also hated the Jews and Judaism. Few know that he authored an authoritative polemic vilifying Christianity, used by Islamic apologists today to vilify us the same way. His arguments are common today. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, this is an honorific, this Sheikh al-Islam, given to major scholars of Islam, the top, top elite scholars, wrote a similar polemic work, quoted routinely today as well. Ibn Taymiyyah's work has been incorporated into the Sharia. Let's look at the poem as a start. O oh Christ worshippers, we want an answer to our question from your wise ones. If the Lord was murdered by some people's act, what kind of God is this? We wonder, was he pleased by what they did to him? If yes, blessed be they, they achieved his pleasure. 
But if he was discontented, this means their power had subjugated him. Was the whole entity left without a sustainer? So who answered the prayers? Were the heavens vacated when he laid under the ground somewhere? Were all the worlds left without a god to manage while his hands were nailed? Why did not the angels help him when they heard him while he wailed? How could the rod stand to bear the true Lord when he was fastened? How could the irons reach him and had his body pinned? How could his enemy's hands reach him and slap his rear? And was Christ revived by himself? Or was the reviver another god? What a sight it was, a grave that enclosed their god. Stranger still is the belly that confined him. He stayed there for nine months in utter darkness, fed by blood. Then he got out of the womb as a small baby, weak and gasping to be breastfed. He ate and drank and did what that naturally resulted, which is urination and defecation. Is this what you call a god? High exalted be Allah above the lies of Christians. All of them will be held accountable. And don't forget in Islam, this accountability will be in this world at the hands of the Muslims and then in the next world at the hands of Allah. All of them will be held accountable for their libels, both cross worshippers. For what reason is the cross exalted and blame is cast upon those who reject it? Is it not logical to break it and burn it? This is to break the cross. You might recall ISIS made a big deal of breaking the cross. So is it not logical to break and burn it along with the one who innovated it? Innovation in this case refers to Paul, right? Who they say that is the founder of the Trinitarian faith. Now this is their claim regarding the falsification of the Bible and the message of Jesus. And innovation is a crime in Islam. It is called bidda. I've covered this in my discussion on the Sharia and other shows. But bidda is basically reprehensible, illegal innovation. It is essentially blasphemy in Sharia. Since the Lord was crucified on it, his hands were fastened to it. Thus the cross should be broken and burned. This is really a cursed cross to carry, so discard it. Do not kiss it. This is actually an informal instruction to us. Do not kiss it. The Lord was abused on it, and you adore it. So it is clear that you are one of his enemies. And Ibn Qayyim, in his further writing, makes it very clear. Christians are the enemies of Jesus. Christians are the enemies of the true Jesus, the Islamic Jesus. And thus the enemies of Allah. And the enemies of Allah must be fought. If you extol it because it carried the Lord of the worlds, why don't you prostrate yourself and worship graves? Worshipping graves is also illegal. It says haram in Islam. Since the grave contained your God in it, so Christ worshipper, open your eyes. This is the beginning and this is the end. So, according to Orthodox Islam, Christians are meant to follow Islam and worshipping at graves is forbidden or haram. And since one who is a Christian abhors the idea of worshipping a grave, how is it possible for them to worship the cross? I'll be doing a show on Reason Dance's Apologetics channel with uh, Thaddeus and also with Sonia Azam. We will be discussing this in the future. This is simply an introduction to that. But let's get into the idea of anti-Christian polemics and anti-Jesus polemics in Islam. You'll notice Islamic anti-Christian polemics are consistent. The reason is that they are derived from a handful of Islamic scholarly sources. The Islamic apologists always say the same things because they're drawing upon the same sources. Their imams have read the same books and are repeating the contents of those books. The basics of the anti-Christian, anti-Jesus views are learned in the madrasa from age five. If you read the madrasa manuals, there's a consistency. They all have the same message. They, again, they all draw from the same original book and all of them are just variations upon that theme. They continue this indoctrination with more detail at their mosques. They're told what they should say, what they should think. The specific detail may well be withheld from them. The imams know the actual documents. The imams read the original scholarly texts that provide them with all the instructions. However, Muslims have a general view of this. This is general Islamic knowledge, if not the specific detail. The major sources they draw from are few. I've only identified at this point half a dozen. Ibn Qayyim is one, and we will look deeper into his work and others in upcoming episodes. Now, Qayyim's views are the standard, normal, orthodox Islamic view. It is not radical. It is just basic, standard Islam. It is normal Islam. It is perfectly in alignment with the Sharia of Muhammad. Let's do a quick intro. Christianity is the worship of Satan. In Islam, it is called the Deen al-Batl, the religion of falsehood. 
the religion of Satan. So do they seek for other than the religion of Allah, while all creatures in the heavens and earth have, willing or unwilling, bowed to his will, accepted Islam, and to him they shall all be brought back. Among the former or the latter generations, no other religion is accepted from anyone. If anyone desires a religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted of him. This is Quran 3.85. Quran 3.85. And it means entirely what it says. So by the contention of Ibn Tamiyyah and Ibn Qayyim and the Sharia, Islam is meant for the entire world, no exceptions. All other religions are cancelled. Islam replaces them all. All people must submit to Islam. Who can be better in religion than one who submits? and follows the religion of Abraham. And the religion of Abraham, Jesus, Moses, Aaron, David, was Islam. This is the claim of the Muslims. How could not a person with minimal reasoning ability he can rely on distinguish between a religion whose foundations are set universal? Instead of surrendering to the devil and a religion whose structure is founded on the precipice of shaky mud on the verge of collapsing and dragging with its owner in the fire. It leads to fire because it is founded on the worship of fire, on enjoining partners between the most gracious and Satan, between him and idols. In other words, the Trinity and enjoining partners with Allah, or with God, having a Trinity, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, this is Satanism. This is shirk. It's the highest sin in Islam. It is the highest sin to Allah and thus Satanic. Jesus spat on, prophesied Muhammad. Or religion whose structures is founded on the worship of crosses and pictures on the ceilings and walls, proclaiming that the Lord descended from the chair of his glory and became attached to the inside of a woman's womb, dwelled in there for a period of time amidst the location where the sexual organs join. Then he came out as suckling, growing up, gradually crying, eating, drinking, urinating, sleeping, and playing with other children. Then they led him to the wooden cross, face spat on. And remember, Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am the apostle of Allah, confirming the law, and I give glad tidings of an apostle to come after me, whose name shall be Muhammad. Ahmad is a contraction of Muhammad. Jesus, the brother prophet to Muhammad. So they speak of Christian lies, falsehood, and prevarication. Jesus spoke against what the Trinitarians the cross worshippers said about him and against the traits of imperfection, shame and contempt they attributed to him. I would not go away and leave you like orphans. I will come back and pray behind this imam. So Jesus will come back and he will pray in submission to Allah behind Muhammad. This is my entrustment to you. If you keep it, the blessing of Allah will stay with you. An advisor who foretold the coming of his brother in prophethood, Muhammad. So, may Allah bless him for being such an advisor who foretold the coming of his brother in prophet Muhammad. This, in Islam, is the message of Jesus. His brother in prophethood, Muhammad, believed in him and confirmed his prophethood. So, Christians repeat the Jew hatred of Ibn Qayyim. So, let's look at the nation before the mission. When Allah sent Muhammad, the people of the book and the pretenders of faith, the hypocrites who followed no book, the people of the book are two kinds, the cursed ones, the Jews, and those who went astray, the Christians. The people who angered God are the Jews, the people of lies and falsifications, of perfidy, deception, and chicanery. The murderers of the prophets, the people of usury. Usury is legal and is given in Deuteronomy. They're allowed to do usury. Um, read Deuteronomy, good grief. And they are the most malicious of all people in intentions, the worst in temperament, the furthest to mercy, and the closest to vengeance. Hatred is their nature, enmity and bitterness are their habits, habits of machination, lies and trickery. In their midst, the most wicked is the wisest, the shrewdest is the most deceitful, the level-headed, who is never found among them, is not a true Jew. Among all people, they are the shortest in patience, the most excessive in wrongdoings to their families at home. This is also Orthodox Islam. If you read through the Islamic sources, you'll find an extensive hatred of Jews and a vilification of Jews. And... You'll notice too soon a complete vilification of Christians. Christians are cattle. The second kind, the Trinitarians, are the people who went astray. They are the worshippers of the cross. They blasphemed against God in an unprecedented way. And you realize what the punishment is for blasphemy in Islam. It is death.
they were judged as being more strained in mindlessness than camels, cattle, and sheep. They exchanged the message of the Tawhid, which is the Unitarianist or Oneness of God in Islam, by joining partners to him, in other words, the Trinity. They exchanged true guidance for misguidance. They rejected the message of Islam and accepted a false belief. The illusioned abandoners accepted the cross and idols as gods. Trinitarian as a faith, rejection as a religion, and the path of misguidance and indignation as a direction. Say whatever you wish about a sect, the cornerstone of whose tenets is that God is a part of three, that Mary is his companion. So Muhammad believed that the Trinity was Jesus, Mary, and God. Nowhere has this been shown to be Christian doctrine, but okay. And the Messiah is his son. Their religion is drinking wine, eating pork, abandoning circumcision, indulgence in adoring unclean things, permissiveness in eating everything unblessed for human consumption from an elephant to a gnat. To them, what is lawful or unlawful is what the priest decides it is. Their religion is what he sanctions, and it is he who forgives sins. This is a complete misrepresentation of Christian doctrine. But this is standard. You may have heard and seen this on YouTube, Facebook, and other sites where they discuss Christianity, where Islamic apologists discuss Christianity. This is what they believe. And uh, talking about eating pork, I mean, Takiyah and Islam go together like pork and bacon. Islam is the only religion accepted by Allah, of which there is no other religion on earth. Use the sword on Christians. So he should not say what the incapable ignorant had said. The faith rejectors can only be treated with the sword, and there is no need to reason with them. Well, that's fascinating. The sword came to put the proof into effect. Oh, we can't beat you with arguments, so we'll just decapitate you with swords. Makes perfect sense. It's Islam we're talking about. So the sword came to put the proof into effect, to protect its implementation, to redress the obdurate opposer who stands against the right of self-expression and freedom of speech, and a warning to the evading rejecter. Yes, don't reject Islam or the sword will come out. So we sent our apostles with clear signs. We sent down with them the book and the balance of right and wrong that men may stand forth in justice. And we sent down iron in which is material for mighty war. If you read Ibn Taymiyyah, he goes further. He quotes the same passage and he says that the disciples and Jesus did not speak about war. Only the Muslims are given this commandment. The religion of Islam was defended through the sharp sword. It is the remedy of the malady of ignorance. And of course, the sword is the cure for the ill of every reasoning man. When people annoy you, kill them. Christians are guilty of altering the Bible and denying Muhammad. So they extracted Muhammad's undisguised name from their books, the Jews and the Christians books. That means the Torah, the rest of the Bible, as well as the Gospels. It mentions some of the unseemly accounts of the people of both books, the Jews and the Christians, and what they are up to. They are the most notorious among people in forsaking their apostles. The scriptures of the apostles bear witness to their unfaithfulness and their straying from the right path. Religions are six in number. One is for the most gracious Allah, and five are for Satan. And of course, they are mentioned in the Quran. Those who believed in the Quran, those who follow the Jewish scripture and the Sabians, the Christians, the Magans and Polytheists, God will judge them on the day of judgment. He who did not embrace Islam among them had to pay the jizya and was humbled. 9.5, Quran 9.5 These two unbelieving nations, the people who angered God, the Jews and the misguided people, the Christians, have to pay the jizya and be subdued. It is categorically known that all the lines of the prophets believed in the forthcoming message of Muhammad bin Abdullah. All of the prophets were foretelling the arrival of Muhammad. And the two belying nations are the Jews and the Christians. So this applies to the misguided nations who are more astray than a herd of livestock. And these are the Nazarenes, the Christians, who are not expected to be better than their predecessors, the Jews. Muhammad will spill blood. Where do the minds of the calf worshippers, the Jews, and the cross worshippers, the Christians, who made out of themselves a laughing stock to all wise men through the insipid comments of their minds, and by what they attributed to their worshipped idols stand compared to the minds of the Muslims? Well, we don't drink urine. They're lying against Allah, their most abhorrent blasphemies against them, their lies about the Messiah, and their adulteration to his true religion. 
coming of a prophet whose time has come near, follow him, O you, the community of the Jews. He will be sent, this is Muhammad, he will be sent with an enjoinment, an injunction, this is a legal injunction, to spill blood, to capture lands and women of those who intend to stand in his way. Do not let this prevent you from following him. Uh, yeah, sounds, sounds, like a, sounds like a great man. Dogs urinate on their symbols. Then he fought against them. He humbled them. Sounds like 9-5. He chased them out of their lands. He imposed tribute on them and declared them to be among the people of hell. They are the worst of livestock in the sight of God. When they say God, they mean Allah. Now, if one can tolerate the mischievous deeds of these people at all levels and hold himself back from fighting them, their blasphemies are intolerable and pose more than enough a cause and a duty to fight them as one would get rid of a brute animal, harmful and wicked by nature. They chose to worship handmade pictures drawn on the walls and painted with different colors, red, yellow, and blue. If a dog comes close to these walls, it may happen that it may urinate on these pictures. Yet the makers of these pictures would still venerate them, kneel and humble themselves in front of them, weep and ask for forgiveness, mercy, sustenance, blessings. Final slide, urine and Christian prayer. The prayer of the Nazarenes ridicules the worshipped deity. They're referring here to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is what they refer to. Ibn Taymiyyah discusses the same topic. They claim that this is an insult to God. They chose a way of prayer during which the most devoted and ascetic amongst them would consider it no great matter if he happens to have passed urine dripping on his thighs and legs. Then he would open a conversation with whomever happens to be sitting beside him, and most probably the chat would be about some mundane matters like the price of wine or pork, who won in gambling, what dish he prepared at home, and the like. And he would even interrupt his prayer to talk about similar things and then urinate in his seat if he can. I don't know if um, anyone out there who regularly urinates in his seat during Sunday prayers. This is what they teach in their mosques. This is what Islamic apologists are alluding to. This is from the opening dozen pages in the book. The book is 360 pages long. Believe me, it gets worse. It gets worse than this. This is what they teach Muslims about Christianity. Um, yeah, so I will be discussing this at length in future. Um, thank you for your time. Please do support the channel. I spend hours on this work and I I really appreciate those who have donated. I've been able to buy software that I needed. Uh, the video software, buy a license for that. I've been able to buy a license for Microsoft Office and other things and I really do appreciate it. And uh, this is hours and hours of work. Um, stay safe out there. Warsaw was in lockdown due to uh, you know what. So take care and um, thank you. Have a really wonderful day.